Okay, we'll begin the interview. Today is Monday, March 21st, 2016, and I'm interviewing Mr. Gary R. Sigler at the Illinois State Library in Springfield, Illinois. Mr. Sigler is 73 years old, having been born on July 14th, 1942. My name is Joanne Jennings, and I'll be your interviewer today. Okay, please state for the recording what war and branch of service you served in. In the Vietnam War, uh, United States Air Force. Okay, and where were you born? I was born in Bloomington, Illinois. Okay, and please tell me a little bit about your family growing up, siblings, um, um, I have one sister uh, who's still alive, it's married to a veterinarian in Colorado, mm -hmm. uh, mother and father, that was pretty much our family. Uh, I do have a lot of relatives around Hayworth and Leroy. What did your parents do when you were growing up? Oh, my dad did a little bit of everything. Uh, the earliest, he was a farmer to begin mm -hmm. with and then owned a little grocery store and uh, worked for a washing machine repair company and uh, we then moved to Texas and he worked on the oil field equipment in mm -hmm. Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, then off to Colorado and different things there. Did you have any um, other family members in the military? Uh, just an uncle mm -hmm. is all that I can think of. Mm -hmm. Most of my relatives were farmers, so they were pretty much exempt from World War II and the Korean War for that matter. Okay. <clears throat> um, how old were you? Uh, what were you doing, I guess, before you entered service? How? I, um, I went to college went to at college. Colorado State University in Fort Collins, Colorado. Mm -hmm. So I guess you could say I was a student. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to say I majored in electrical engineering, but that didn't work too well. It was magic, so I changed to psychology and was really an Air Force ROTC major is what it really boiled down okay. to. So that's what I was going to ask you, uh, did you enlist or were you drafted? Yeah, no, I. that was a land-grant college and in those days you had to have ROTC for two years. Then the third and fourth year were voluntary and I liked it so I signed up and passed all the flight physicals so I was mm -hmm. going to pilot training. How old were you? Oh, 21 I guess about that time. Um, so you enlisted and then like what what dates did you serve? When did you start your service? When did I start? Mm -hmm. And uh, where? I mean like how did that? Yeah, I uh, started uh, service at the active duty part mm -hmm. at in Lubbock, Texas at Reese Air Force Base in the class of 66 E. Uh, so that was the year uh, and was there for oh, about a year going through pilot training. Mm -hmm. uh, then if you want me to continue. I do, please. Then I was assigned to uh, the RF-4C aircraft. That's a two-seat jet fighter that is only equipped with cameras but it's very similar to the normal F-4 Phantom. Uh, was in Shaw Air Force Base, then Mountain Home, Idaho, and then to Vietnam, which I did what every military man do knows you don't, I volunteered. You volunteered to go to Vietnam? Volunteered, my aircraft commander, uh, we were a pretty good team and he was his time was up, he had to go, so I just went with him. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was in the fall of 66. And you were 21 at the time, you think? Is well, that, no, I was older than that 42? then, okay, yeah. 22 or so. Yeah. 
because you were born to 42, okay. Fall of 66. Already. Um, were you married by then? Were you married? Yes. Uh, I met my wife in uh, college. Mm -hmm. She was from Illinois, Table Grove, Illinois. Mm -hmm. uh, and we got married right before I went into service okay. on January the 10th. And our honeymoon was driving to Lubbock. <laughs> okay. Oh. And what were your early days of training like when you were here in the States um, training? Well, we. We had a lot of classroom mm -hmm. uh, studies in various aspects of the aircraft and how they work and flying and weather and... Had you flown at all before this? I mean, I, you know yeah, that? I did. Uh, they gave me a flight training in a college mm -hmm. in a, a little Cessna aircraft. Mm -hmm. Uh, I didn't actually get a license out of that because I left before I could take a check ride uh, to go off to active duty. Mm -hmm. But that was a fairly good preparation for flight training. And in addition to the classes, the classroom activities, we also had just an awful lot of flying. Mm -hmm. At first, we flew a little twin-engine jet trainer uh, called the T-37. Uh, it was, we called it the Tweety Bird because it's kind of what it sounded like. Yeah. And then later in a supersonic trainer, uh, the T-38. We called that one the candy-coated rocket. You had mentioned something about one of the planes. You said it was equipped with cameras only. Is that yes? The the aircraft I was assigned to for combat was uh, only equipped with cameras. Uh, we could take from very low altitude to very high altitude pictures of one sort or another. Some of them were infrared. There was a radar imaging aspect to one of the cameras. And, but most of them were photographs. Okay. So after you, you named all those bases here in the States, then you went to Vietnam. Then I went to Vietnam. Vietnam. You volunteered. And your job assignment was? Be a pilot. Be a pilot. It was, I flew in the back seat, which the RF force had two pilots. So I was in essence like a co-pilot. Okay. Uh, I ran all the aircraft systems and ran the radar and did all the navigating and that sort of thing. But I could fly from the back seat, so I flew quite a bit in those days. Mm -hmm. And then you and your co-pilot, you took pictures of? Yeah, we took pictures of battle damage or target assessment, mm -hmm. um, like uh, an army barracks or a bridge. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, our last target was a railroad bridge in downtown Hanoi. Uh, you know, we never quite got there due to the weather, but okay. that was um. it. When you first arrived to Vietnam, do you remember, I mean, how did you feel? Were you scared? Were you... Well, uh, to clarify just a little bit, I flew out of Thailand. Okay. Udorn, Thailand. But all of our flights were over North Vietnam. I see. Okay. Um, and, yeah, it was kind of scary, but you get busy. Mm -hmm. when you're flying and especially in combat you've got to look around all the time and all the systems and listen to the radio what's going on with other aircraft and so forth so you get too busy to worry about it much once you get in the air so you would go back to Thailand every after every right. mission or whatever I see okay and um, if we want to talk about your, um, I guess if you want to tell me some of your training 
or not training your missions that you went on well um, um, the DFC was for a low-level higher speed uh, target of an army barracks that uh, DFC distinguished flying cross I'm sorry uh, that uh, this is the medal you're talking about yes that you the medal. okay mm-hmm. uh, that was an unusual mission in that we went in very low like 200 feet above the ground and just barely subsonic uh, and matter of fact I remember going along and looking up at the top of a hill and there was a guy up there with a rifle shooting at us. I can remember that. It just flashed. But we went past him pretty quick. Uh-huh. And uh, took a lot of ground fire. We didn't get hit, but uh, they were sure shooting at us. And we made it through. And, and what were you trying to do again on that? We were f- uh, photographing an Army barracks area. Uh, with some related missile sites and so forth with it. And that was uh, one of your missions? That was one mission. Mm-hmm. Um, most of the time we flew at night, which I really liked, and, and so did my aircraft commander, a guy named Mark Stevenson. Um, we kind of felt like if we could see them, they could see us. Mm-hmm. And the photo reconnaissance business is what I like to think of as being a jewel thief. The object is to get in, get out, get your pictures before they know you're there. Mm-hmm. So they might shoot at you on the way out, but not on the way in. Mm-hmm. And we were pretty good at that. We were good night flyers. We uh, weren't good enough in one instance, though. My 92nd mission and my uh, Front Seater's 93rd mission. And this was Mark Stevenson? Mark Stevenson, Uh who at that time was a major. Uh, We were to photograph the railroad bridge in downtown Hanoi. It had been bombed that day and they were taking battle uh, damage assessment pictures. Well, we ran into some weather, and we were actually going to use infrared photography, but the infrared would not go through that weather, not to get pictures, so we turned around and headed back out. And then we had indications they had fired a surface air missile at us. And I think both of us were looking out of the cockpit at the same time, looking for the missile. And we were about 200 feet above the ground. Uh, and I looked back in, and there were there was a hill ahead of us, higher than we were. And the trees on the top of the hill were, they have 200-foot trees over there. Mm-hmm. So I hollered at my aircraft commander, who grabbed the stick and pulled us up like 10 degrees and I was high because um, he would get the same indications. He flew off a different system, but he knew what was going on. He pulled up and we hit the trees it, uh, while avoiding the missile. Um, and it ruptured the fuel tank behind my seat. and. To this day, if I close my eyes, I can see the pattern the flames made when they hit the dashboard of my aircraft over on this side. And I was on fire. My flight suit was burning. My gloves were burning. And to eject yourself, you have a face curtain that you reach up and pull down, and that ejects you. Well... I heard somebody screaming in my headset and I realized with shock actually that it was me and I think I was in a state of shock and I grabbed the handle and one there were rubber coated wires and 
the rubber was burning. So I threw a handful of burning rubber on the floor and then used an alternate ejection handle that's right between your knees. And uh, the seat left the aircraft, knocked me out, knocked me unconscious. And I didn't wake up till we hit the ground. Now, I knew that there was a taller hill ahead of the one we hit because I could see it on the radar. And I think that what happened was the aircraft hit the next hill. I went over the over the top of it and down the other side of the hill and uh, the aircraft commander I didn't know for sure but later he was killed in the crash. Uh, so he very did good not, friend. He did not eject from the plane? He was not able to. Uh -huh. uh, he would have stayed with it to see more what was wrong and I would have stayed with it too if I hadn't been on fire. Mm -hmm. And, and the whole process was just automatic. It's yes. what you're trained to do, and you do it. Um, I always felt guilty about it, that somehow I didn't warn him more, but or take control of the aircraft myself, because I had a better view of what was up there. But I didn't. Um, and uh, so I felt the guilt of it, but... You know, you just learn to live with that. It happened so fast. It yeah. Um, it was very fast. I think from the time we hit the trees till I ejected was less than five seconds. And I know the aircraft at the speed we were going would have hit the side of the next hill. And my parachute went through some trees and I landed flat on my back and woke up at the same time so I have no idea what it feels like to ride in a parachute but I there was a giant fire over the hill I could see all the glow of it so that's where the aircraft hit and one of the sad parts of that is he had 93 missions that means we'd had to flown a 94th for him, a 95th, and then we'd have gotten easy ones that, because uh, they know by that time you, mm -hmm. you get kind of nervous. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, just as a little sidelight to that, the last message I sent home in a letter was that I guess my wife figured out that I was getting kind of nervous as I got closer to the end of the tour and asked me about it and in the last letter I sent her that I mailed that day it said I'm not afraid to die in an airplane because it can't hurt for any length of time but what scares me is the idea of being shot down, captured, and spending the rest of the war in an Oriental prison camp. And sure enough, that's what happened. She got that letter after she was notified after that she was, was gone. Notified. And they didn't know. They, I was just missing. They didn't have any idea what. Um, it took them about a day and a half to capture me. That's what I was going to ask. So after you know, you ejected and you were um, on the ground. How bad were your injuries? Were you able to... Well, uh, I didn't know all at that time, but I had broken some vertebrae in my back and I was pretty badly burned over this side of my body. Mm -hmm. um, were you able to move or were you just I was able there? to move. Mm -hmm. um, and this and was near Hanoi? This would have been about 80 miles northwest of Hanoi. Okay. Uh, if you can picture Florida, mm -hmm. Hanoi would be right off the tip of Florida. And Florida would have been a mountain ridge in Vietnam that ran up. We called it Thud Ridge because F-105s, the joke was, 
thud is the sound they make when they hit the ground. Mm -hmm. So we called it Thud Ridge because there are quite a few lost up there. Mm -hmm. And so we were up past that and headed back west toward Thailand, right on the edge of the mountains. Uh, and we knew they had fired a missile at us because we knew exactly where it came from. Mm -hmm. And I knew that that site was active. But I guess it didn't matter. But at any rate, that's... So what time of day was it when you were... It's about 10 o'clock at night. 10 o'clock at night. And mm -hmm. then what did you do when you were on the ground? What? Well, I gathered up... The, you have a little pack that's in the seat of your aircraft that comes off with you. And it has some emergency things in it. And, uh, water and a few other things like that so I grabbed that pack and took off west or at least what I thought was west because if at that time they couldn't rescue you or if you were east of the Red River uh, and I was east of the Red River and why couldn't they rescue you because the helicopters couldn't survive up there okay. uh, you know if a fighter capable of twice the speed of sound can't survive. Okay. It's pretty tough on helicopters. Mm -hmm. uh, there were times when they could get up there, but I knew my best chance was to cross the Red River to the west. So I headed off that direction. And frankly, at one time, it sort of sunk in, as you might suspect, what I'd said about being captured in my letter and um, we carried 38 pistols, 38 caliber pistols and I thought about shooting myself but I decided that I didn't have anything broken I could still move so I would move as best and as fast and as far as I could and and uh, so that's I decided um, and then I did that I took all the antibiotic pills that were in the kit because I pretty much knew I was going to be captured mm -hmm. and uh, about a day and a half later which incidentally was May the 1st my daughter's first birthday she captured. was one that day when I was captured and you were aware were you aware that it was May 1st I mean you knew the day oh yeah and yeah okay. she was a few months old when I left um, then I saw her again when she was six years old, mm -hmm. but um, you know I got cornered on the top of a low hill with no real undergrowth. It was either shoot her out with the, what we called a posse of peasants or give up to them. Well, I already decided I didn't want to commit suicide, so I just surrendered. And it, it's really a good thing, too, because uh, I was in very bad physical condition. Uh, it, water is a big problem, even in a jungle, to get enough. And burns run mm -hmm. fluid, you know. So I was very dehydrated and weak and not thinking clearly at all and I was still in a state of shock I think mm -hmm. and uh, I, I don't remember a lot of that but I know I moved and at one point I walked through a village really? which is, shows my mind wasn't working right but it was the shortest way to get to the other side and I guess everybody was out looking for me and there was nobody oh, there. Nobody was in the village did you? Yeah stop or did you keep going? <laughs> I kept going but kept going. I think that's probably where they took me back to. Um, so who was it then that captured you? The it was civilians. People? Civilians. Uh, North Vietnamese civilians. Um, how did they treat you? They weren't too bad. They cut off my boots and um, so I was barefooted so I couldn't run away from them. I couldn't run anyway at that point. But they took me to a hut 
in this village. And I was very weak, and just laid down on the ground. And the guy whose hut it was, and I guess he was the leader of this group, brought me a rock for a pillow. And now that may not sound like much of a pillow, but he was being kind when he did it. And he brought me some rice, sort of like soup, boiled rice, and uh, which I could eat a few bites of. And then the army caught up with uh, me, and they came to pick me up. So I'm they sure. turned you in, or yes, they, they turned me in, and uh, they were out looking for me. You know, when I said I went through that village. Those were probably the people, uh, but um, the army picked me up, uh, took me to some little army camp, and they had a bamboo hut that was kind of half in a tree. It was almost a treehouse bamboo hut, and they put me in there, and an honest-to-gosh, real Vietnamese nurse came and treated my burns, which was the last time, his first time and the last time practically I got them treated. Um, and they were, you know, not mean to me at that stage. But then later I was put in a blindfold and into a jeep and went somewhere. Still there in that from that village then? They probably yeah, followed you. from wherever that camp was. Mm -hmm. um, they took me to another village or maybe it was that village, I'm not sure. But I was blindfolded and they walked me through sort of a gauntlet of people who hit me and threw rocks and all that. And you were blindfolded during that? I was that? blindfolded. And you were still barefoot? Yeah. Still barefoot. And then they they took off my blindfold and there was a soldier in front of me holding a rifle that had a bayonet about that long yeah. and pointing it right at me and I thought, aha, there was a fire in the background. I figured they're going to roast me over that fire mm -hmm. like a pig on a spit. Mm -hmm. But they didn't, they just beat on me a little more and somebody read, no doubt, some condemnation, damnation of me as a Yankee air pirate, I suppose. And then they walked me back to the Jeep through the people again. Was there any English speaking? I, I mean, uh, at that time, nobody spoke English. No, no translator or anything. Um, then, not too long after that, I had an interrogation along the way with a guy that did speak some English, and he basically was trying to figure out who I was, where I came from, and all that stuff, and what other attacks were going to happen or whatnot. Uh, really, pretty much stuff I didn't know anything about. Uh, then I was put back on the Jeep and I was taken to Hanoi. Okay, and um, how long were you there before? What was the before you were your plane went down? How long of a time frame was that? Um, it was a little short of six months. So you were there like six months. Yeah, I I had to get to a hundred missions to complete how often my combat did you? tour. But I had you also had to have six months on station. I hadn't gotten to six months, and I, I don't know what, the, there had been a couple of weeks where I wouldn't have had anything to do before I could get back to the States. Okay. All right, back to, so I, I just wanted to know how long you had been there before, you know, how, how long it took you to get those 92 yeah. missions. Um, so they took you to Hanoi. Yeah. And the... There is an old French prison in downtown Hanoi, or there was. Its name is Wallo. Uh, Ho Chi Minh was kept there at one time, and Ho Chi Minh was their leader, uh, led their revolution, and 
was their prime minister or whatever his title was. Mm -hmm. um, and Wallo meant the flaming forge. And Ho Chi Minh had said something about being steeled, made of steel, made to steel in the flaming forge of Wallo. Uh, there was sections to this and one section was what we called Little Vegas, another one was uh, New Guy Village. And I was taken to Little Vegas which had several small buildings in it uh, and all the buildings were named of course after Las Vegas like the casino. And so you our, guys named the Yeah buildings. we named them. Okay. Uh, and I was in one of those buildings. I was interrogated for about two weeks. Um, How were beat you on. Yeah. And uh, I very quickly learned there's rules that governor, govern military people when they're captured uh, called the code of conduct. And one of those rules was give only name, rank, serial number, and date of birth. That's all you have to say, according to the Geneva Conventions. Mm -hmm. uh, and they also said if you have an injury, play to your injury like it's a lot worse than it really is. Well, I wasn't in very good shape, and they discovered if you told them that your arm hurt, they'd just twist your arm. So you ended up giving them information. Hopefully, well, I, I called it lie, cheat, and steal. Uh, you'd lie to them as best you could. And, and they were not very sophisticated people, so some lies were pretty easy to do, mm -hmm. to carry mm -hmm. off. But the trick was you had to give them something. Mm -hmm. um, the Air Force called it the second line of resistance that you were taught in Air Force Survival School. Uh, you went through a POW camp experience in Air Force Sur Survival School. And they called it the second line of resistance and that's when you figure out that name, rank, serial number doesn't work. They are going to get more than that. So what you got to do is outsmart them. So, Typically, you would let them beat on you, torture you, until they would believe that you really did give up. I have a whole theory on all this. Um, you, the trick is to bend before you break. Because if they really do break you, you will find yourself writing, saying, doing anything they tell you to do with no control over your body. It's like being in a state of shock uh, where you're watching your hands do something. Uh, so you tried to give them other things that would sound reasonable. Like they brought me a map and said, show us where they're going to bomb next. Well, heck, I was a reconnaissance lieutenant. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. They don't tell lieutenants anything in the Air Force. So, so what did you, t yeah. So them. I just started, the map was some flight map they'd captured off somebody. So it was printed in English mm -hmm. with all the Vietnamese names and so forth. Mm -hmm. And it was marked with army barracks and bridges and airfields and missile sites. And I just kept pointing at the ones they're going to bomb next until the guy got tired of writing. Because I, I just kept pointing. I probably pointed out 300 places. <laughs> and then when he got tired, he, oh, okay, I guess this guy's cooperated and mm -hmm. sent me off. Um, after about two weeks, I was, oh, I got to tell you about a meal. Um, the typical thing was to have a bowl of rice, boiled rice, um, some sort of greens, like 
they had this plant that was kind of like a smart weed that grows in the fields around here. It tastes a little like spinach, and they would have some of that in soup, and that was pretty much it. Well, one day I had a spoonful of pork and beans, and it brought tears to my wow. eyes because that was the closest thing I had uh -huh. seen to real food. Where did you get that? They, it was just part of the rations. Mm -hmm. But this was just a the like you said when you were first captured, like a two week period that you're interrogated. Yeah, this you. was the two weeks. How often did you get a meal in a day? Did they um, give you three meals a day? Two times. Two times a day. Yeah, something in the morning and something in the evening. Did they let you sleep? Your well, accommodations, you could, you could how, were, what, how were they? You could do whatever you wanted as long as the interrogator wasn't there and the door was locked. Uh, and sleep was one of the things you tried to do because they would interrogate you any hour of the day or night. Mm -hmm. uh, they particularly liked to come in at night because that's a more frightening experience mm -hmm. really. Um, and it was never pleasant when they came in, never. When they beat you, how? What did? Well, they, how? With what? Or how? Uh, mostly in my case, they tied my elbows behind my back. Now, when and I was badly burned on this arm, and you had so the rope was right? around here, and you they would tie you and stand on your elbows until they touched behind your back, and then they would put a type of handcuff that uh, we don't use here. It's kind of like two W's stuck together and they put your hands in those and they're all too tight. So they squeeze those down and you lose feelings in your hands and your arms. And, uh, and sometimes they would tie a rope around your neck and bend your feet up at your knees and tie it to your feet. So if you relaxed, you choked yourself. And they would leave you like that for hours. Um, that was probably the most common thing. We called that the rope trick. They seemed to like that. But they also would beat you with fan belts and gun butts and whatever. Uh, that was, and, and I think we determined that 95% of the men who were captured were tortured mm -hmm. and the other five were captured so late in the war that they didn't do anything with them. Mm -hmm. uh, some people much worse than others. The more senior mm -hmm. you were, the higher ranking you were, the more trouble you had. Mm -hmm. And I was a, a lieutenant, so I was pretty junior. Uh, and I was, I was probably one of the youngest of the long-term POWs. There were only a few guys younger than I was. And I think that helped in that, you know, I'm, my health generally was probably better. But at any rate, after two weeks, they took me to another camp that, that we called the zoo and it was on the edge of town. It was an old French film studio. It even had a swimming pool. Hmm. Of course, the swimming pool was like a sewer, mm -hmm. and <laughs> we didn't get anywhere around it. But then there were different buildings in this big walled off area, and I was put in one we called the office, uh, and held in solitary confinement for about a year with interrogations still came and all that and uh, it was forbidden to communicate with any of the other criminals the uh, other soldiers that were captured yeah they called us criminals oh. air pirates um, me they told me i was a spy because i took pictures mm -hmm. said then you know we execute spies well, the thing was, you'd, they'd say, we'll give you a trial before we shoot you. So uh, in solitary confinement, what were your conditions? And Well, um, I was 
most of the time in a cell that was about six feet wide and 11 feet long. And there were was it some pallet of boards that was a bed. Uh, four walls around it? Or four bars walls, or clear four up. Walls. Light bulb in the ceiling. There was a window with bars. It was bricked about halfway up. And it had shutters on it, which sometimes they'd open, sometimes not. Um, you couldn't see out. Mm -hmm. And it was too high for that. Uh, the bathroom was a bucket. Uh, and I think in that year I figured out that I'd been out of that room on the average of probably 15 minutes a day at the most. And for what reason? They would take you out so you could wash. And they were, they were pretty good about that. They did that every day. Uh, or empty your bucket. And that was pretty much it, wash clothes and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, Again, you in, in solitary, did they give you um, how, meals? How there were still two meals a day, two same sort of stuff, no better, no worse. Mm -hmm. uh, the only time you were really too hungry was when they were pretty hungry. On the other hand, when I came out of there, I weighed a little over 150 pounds which is 100 pounds less than I weigh now <laughs> and probably 50 pounds less than I should have weighed at that time. Well, yeah, do you know you how just, much you weighed when you went in the service? Really? Uh, 190. 190. Uh, and um, they didn't give you anything much at that point so you kind of just lived in your head mm -hmm. and you exercised as much as you could. Were you able to keep track of days? Did you know the date or how long you had been there? Did you know what month? Generally, I knew what day of the week it was. and um, Because you could see the daylight out the window, so you knew. Right. And they had their routine. You know, they'd come around first thing in the morning and bring water mm -hmm. and then about the middle of the day they'd bring a meal and toward the end of the day they'd be another meal and they have mandatory exercise over there not for us particularly for all the people it's a nationwide thing mm -hmm. and they ring gongs and everybody's supposed to be out exercising mm -hmm. um, so, you, you know, those clues. And then they'd ring a gong again in the night time when it was time to go to bed. Uh, and they kind of expected us to keep that same schedule. Um, most of the time, the, guard, the armed guards that were patrolling around really didn't care much what you did but you had a turnkey, an unarmed guard that opened and closed the doors and brought you water and all this, uh, that he would want you to be doing certain things at certain times. For example, when the evening gong went off, you were expected to go to bed. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, how long you, again were you in solitary confinement? Just about a year. A year? Mm -hmm. Um, and what date again were you captured? The date you said it was your daughter's uh, It birthday. was May the 1st. May 1st of what year? Uh, 67. 67. Okay. All right. So after that year, um, well, in confinement, I was what did moved in a cell with two other guys. Uh, they, they were going through a period where they were being a little nicer to us. So they took bricks out of a lot of the windows and so forth so we could actually see out. Uh, and with two other guys, I mean, that gave you a big mental advantage mm -hmm. over being by yourself mm -hmm. because you could um, interact. And anything that you knew more about than those guys, you were the expert. 
Uh, and so you traded stories and information. Where were they from? Oh gosh. One guy was from New England, Boston area. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember about the other guy. I think he was a Midwesterner. Did uh, they make it back home? Yes. Do you, Both of those guys did. Were you able to stay in contact with them? Or? We have an organization called NAMPOW, uh, short for Vietnam POWs, mm -hmm. that we have reunions about every other year and mm -hmm. so forth. And I don't go to all of them, but. Did and then we have that? a net on the internet where. We communicate. It's kind of a big party line email mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. So you can pretty much reach any of them okay. that way. Uh, so we do stay in touch. Uh, I had one cellmate that had been my cellmate for five years in total. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't even talk anymore. We didn't need to talk because we just could read each other's mind yeah. and he probably didn't help me but I've never had great memory and he could remember everything that ever happened so he became my memory so I think that probably got me out of mm -hmm. training for trying to remember stuff mm -hmm. but um, and when you have a reunion you find yourself getting together with the people you were somewhat associated with in the camps. Uh, after I did the cell with the three guys, we were moved over to a, a warehouse in that film studio um, that was called the Annex, and there were several little buildings. And uh, The Annex, we had, there were nine of us in one cell. And so those nine guys I've been very close to, um, they're not all here anymore. But, but they all made it back home? They all made it back mm -hmm. home. I take that back. No, they did. They all made it back home. One guy died of cancer just shortly after he got back. Mm -hmm. Another guy was burned in a fire. Um, you know, but most of the rest of them are mm -hmm. still out there and about. Mm -hmm. um, then at one point they moved us back to the Hanoi Hilton Wallow Prison in a big area and I had 20 roommates at that time. How many total do you know were there? You know, I'm not sure, I think around 600 give or take. Uh, now some of these people were army soldiers that had been captured in the south or in Laos and brought to the north mm -hmm. and then there were prisoners that were captured during the Tet Offensive that they brought north. Mm -hmm. uh, we even had a woman prisoner there had been three and then they released a couple of them on their way to Hanoi. And this woman was a West German nurse. Uh, wasn't in the U.S. military. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen her but I've never really talked to her. You did find yourself knowing everything there is to know about about 30 people. Yeah. And some of the rest of the people are more names than anything. Like John McCain. I met John McCain after the war. You did? I didn't Were you there? The, I mean, you were there at the same time as him? Yes. You didn't know him? I didn't know him. Uh, he was a more senior and a very special guy because his father was the commander of, what was it, the Seventh Fleet or something. His father was an admiral and so he was kind of a treasured prisoner. They always and how did they know that, that this about his oh, father? There were people in the U.S. telling him, sending stuff to him to tell who we were and tell about us. Uh, I hate to say that but it's true. And 
you know, he, he's, he was badly injured when he was captured, and mm -hmm. it's not hard to get information. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, when you can kill somebody or torture them to death or whatever, then you can pretty much get somebody to say anything. Uh, I'm sorry, you know, that doesn't happen to John Wayne in the movies, yeah. but the movies aren't reality. Right, right. One of the toughest men I knew barely survived the torture. Um, so, at any rate, there were nine of us there. Then, uh, during that time period, on May the 10th, whatever year it was, there was an escape where two guys escaped from the building across from us. And they managed to get up in the attic and take some of the tiles off the roof, the tile roof, and get down and climb over the wall and off they went. Well, they were captured about a day later. One of them was a guy from my squadron, Ed Atterbury was his name. And the other guy was John Dermisi. John Dermisi was close to Superman. I mean, he was a tough character. <laughs> uh, but, and he survived all the torture that came after that. Ed Atterbury didn't. Mm -hmm. He died being tortured. Um, and, you know, probably several people did. I think we only knew of like 12 people that we absolutely 100% knew were alive and they didn't come back um, but they sent their bodies back, all 12 of them. Um, a couple of them were insane, literally insane and they didn't want to return them that way. There was another guy who pretended to be permanently injured and insane and um, but he was not. He was just a good actor. Well, they didn't send him back either. Did they kill him? Yeah. He or let him die. Um, yeah, there were... Uh, a couple of people died of injuries or disease and, you know, that sort of thing you would expect. Mm -hmm. Uh, medical care was close to not e non-existent. Uh, like I was said the first time I was treated my wounds and my mm -hmm. burns were one more time later in the camps and that was it. And it was for your burns? Yeah they just smeared oil all over them. Some kind of yellow oil. Um, but they sort of just healed on their own. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was pretty tough because, you know, you wanted to do things, but I couldn't let this arm hang mm -hmm. or the skin would start bleeding. It was so thin. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do a push-up. I couldn't do a sit-up at that time because I'd been so weak. Do you know how long it took for the burns to heal? Probably a year altogether. I was lucky they did heal. Uh, some people had wounds that never healed. Mm -hmm. um, and they still living with them today, some of them. You also said your back, you had some broken vertebrae? Yeah, it turned out I had broken uh, several vertebrae in the lower part of my back. That was really not uncommon for the ejection seat in the F-4. And those just healed on their own, or did they treat you for that? Uh, no, I just... They didn't treat me for it. Um, it's like anybody you would know that has a bad back, mm -hmm. and every once in a while it sort of goes out. Mm -hmm. And when it's out, they can't do anything. Mm -hmm. You can just lay there and be miserable until it sort of gets better. Well, that's kind of the way it was. Um, then uh, we were taken back to the Hanoi Hilton, I told you that. And then all this time, 
or a lot of the time, the Paris peace talks were going on. Mm -hmm. And they would tell us, they had what we called the camp radio, Hanoi Hannah, it's kind of like Tokyo Rose, that broadcasts to all the Americans and would give you news and you'd really have to read between the lines to know the truth because mm -hmm. certainly they didn't tell you. Do you remember anything that was said? Oh, sure, like the Americal Division. They were decimated so many times that it was just not possible, you know. Mm -hmm. it, and de decimated really means 10% of the people killed, but or were killed, but actually I think they used it to mean they just wiped out everybody. Mm -hmm. And there were twice as many airplanes shot down as there really were. And mm -hmm. uh, any bad news you would hear about right away. Like when Kennedy was assassinated, uh, Ted, not Ted, uh, Bobby. Bobby. We heard about that hours later when the interrogators came and told us about it. And um, the, you were, we were able to communicate even though we weren't supposed to. We got pretty good at clandestine communication. Uh, and the new guys shot down would bring in news. Mm -hmm. So they'd fill you in on a lot of the things mm -hmm. and you just sort of put two and two together. Mm -hmm. um, it's per pretty good training for listening to our news media because you still have to read between the lines to find any truth. Uh, but uh, Hanoi Hannah, and um, then uh, we had some interesting people. Ramsey Clark, who was, oh gosh, what was he, Attorney General or some secretary post? Uh, after he was out, he came to visit over there. Han uh, Hanoi Jane, Jane Fonda came to visit, and people were tortured to go see her because nobody would. Um, Did you go see her? No, I didn't. Thank goodness. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you know, one of the things she did was to play a audio tape, make an audio tape to be played to us over the the uh, camp radio system. And in that she said that uh, the war in Vietnam is illegal, immoral, and unjust. And because you participated, you're a war criminal, and you should do everything you can to help the enemy. They also had pictures of her sitting on an anti-aircraft gun this was in Life or Look Magazine, one of those, mm -hmm. saying, I wish I had one of those criminals in my sights. Uh, but we didn't have the gumption to, we wanted to try her for treason. Mm -hmm. And I think the case was easily made, but the government didn't want to. Um, it's too bad. Ramsey Clark made a tape, but nobody knew what he said because he's a politician. <laughs> he just talked. Uh, yeah. And there um, were others. I mean, our, the Japanese film crew one time came through, and but she saw like Jane Fonda saw you, saw not personally you, but I'm saying the prisoners. She saw the conditions. Yes, she did and see she some. saw the way you were. Yeah. You know. They did. She did see some of them. Um. You know, like I say, they were tortured to go see her. Um, and some of them tortured afterwards because they didn't like her, their attitude. <laughs> but Jane Fonda has never been high on our list of admired people. With good reason. Yeah. Uh, but it is what it is. Mm -hmm. There were two guys that we thought they were turncoats. 
that I knew both of them. I'd been in the same building with them. One guy had had a terrible mental breakdown uh, and was, I, I was hardly a man left in the shell uh, compared to what he no doubt was. And the other guy was a snake in the grass. Mm -hmm. He was a Marine Colonel pilot and probably the only Marine I ever knew that is truly an ex-Marine, you know, because Marines, if you're a Marine one time, you're a Marine forever. Mm -hmm. uh, and not this guy. They would have disowned him. But they wouldn't, we couldn't get them tried either. And among the Army troops, there were four or five, I don't know how many, people that they thought were turncoats and probably worse than our two. And I'm not aware that anything happened to them either. But I was never much up on that. Mm -hmm. uh, they kept those people isolated from us. So we hardly knew of their existence. We could theorize it. But. Then at one point, they moved half of us to what we called Dog Patch, a camp just outside of China, way up north. And in the negotiations, um, the Vietnamese wanted to keep half of us, return the other half, and the first half would only go after all the troops were out of Vietnam. Well, Richard Nixon was the president then, and he didn't care much for that idea. So they bombed Hanoi and Haiphong with B-52s. And not just carpet bomb like you did, in, like we did in World War II. Uh, they were after certain targets and accurate enough to hit them. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was one of the guys near China, so I missed that part. The guys that were there said it was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Three foot thick walls just waved. They were so shaken up, and the Vietnamese fired up every hang they had and then got quiet because they didn't have anything else to shoot. So the B-52s really did a number and that caused them to realize that they'd better do something. So I got to, got to go back to Hanoi Hilton. Um, and How long were you at China? Pardon? How long were you in China? Uh, well, not in China, just outside, outside, but uh, it had been about a year or so. Okay, so then you went back. To <laughs> then we went back, and then they put us all in the main part of Wallow Prison of the Hanoi Hilton, uh, which were a number of very large cells around the perimeter, and then a kind of a big open courtyard in the middle. Um, and then they called us out and read to us the terms of the agreements that said that we had to be released. And in the meantime, and they left us all out. So this is the first time in the whole war that we'd been able to get all out in one big group. Mm -hmm. um, then we, they started releasing us in the order we were shot down. Uh, I was in the second large group uh, and uh, we were held up a week because of the bad attitude of the U.S. government. The first group went, then we were supposed to go two weeks later, and they held us up a week, uh, which was a long, long week. But they issued us Western-type clothing and a black bag to take things home with and you didn't have much to take. Um, I didn't talk about communication with people at home. Uh, That's what I was going to ask you. When you were captured, um, how long was it before your family knew that you were captured? Three years. Three years? Mm -hmm. Your wife didn't know? She didn't know took three years and, and periodically they had released a few groups, small groups, two or three guys, 
But they knew your plane went down. They like knew your it was wife down. Knew your plane went down. I was missing. They didn't know exactly where. Um, and it was then that they started letting us write letters back home. So at first they were six line postcard, always very heavily censored. Mm -hmm. You couldn't say the weather is hot here. Mm -hmm. They'd censor that out. And the way they'd censor it is throw it away. <laughs> so you had to be very careful what you said. But uh, families were able to send us a couple care packages and pictures and yeah, like Christmas cards and a did few things like that. Did you receive that care package? I did. And what did you get? Uh, underwear, socks, because we were never issued socks. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, most of us have frostbite, even in that climate, in our feet because of no socks. Uh, and I got a pipe and some pipe tobacco, uh, a few things to eat, and the box wasn't full, so I suspect oh. the guards got Took some, some of the stuff. Mm -hmm. But it was nice. Oh, yeah. uh, it meant a lot. And then at one point they took everything away from us, and they gave most of it back when we left. Mm. So a lot of the cards and pictures, they wouldn't let you keep a picture. You could have it for a day, and that was about it. But then they kept it and gave it to you at the end. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the only real communication I had. We had we traded several letters and cards because they had to use the same card there for a while. One interesting thing, or interesting to me at any rate, was we were on a constant kick to improve ourselves. You had to feel like you improved in some way every day. And we taught classes. A good thing. So one of my cellmates was an artist. He went to art school painting nudes when I was studying calculus. And at any rate, he helped each of us develop our own personal handwriting. Now, new style. Now, you didn't have anything really to write with. You'd use a piece of brick and mm -hmm. mark on the concrete floor. But uh, at any rate, uh, without thinking, my very first letter I put in my new handwriting. Uh -huh. So what happened in those is uh, there was a group called Women's Strike for Peace that was another American communist group that came to North Vietnam. And one of the ladies, and I can't recall her name exactly, was from Chicago, she got ill and they gave her a whole stack of these things to take back with her. So she brought them in the U.S. and just dropped them in the post office box. Well, then one day my wife gets this thing and doesn't look like my handwriting. Was it the first piece of correspondence she'd had from you? Yeah, but she gave it, all the, all the families had a military officer assigned to them. So she gave it to this guy who gave it to the FBI and they were able to determine, yeah, it's different, but it's him. They evaluated the handwriting and... And that's how she knew you were that alive. yeah actually my name got out um, there were you know I can talk hours about this stuff because it's years worth but there was a guy named Doug Hedgel. Doug Hedgel was a seaman on a destroyer and supposedly fell off the destroyer into the Gulf of Tonkin. Uh, at first they thought he was some sort of spy or something. Well, he was only like 19 years old. He had been a pretty young spy. And they thought he was stupid. And he was not stupid. Mm -hmm. He was very smart, smart enough to make them think he was stupid. 
at any rate, he was released with a group of three, two other guys, uh, released early, and he's the only one that was released early that had the permission of our senior officers to go. The other guys just went. Uh, and at any rate, he had memorized everybody's names. We had an exercise where at one time I had, oh, 360 names or so organized by service, by rank, and I knew something very personal about each one of them that Vietnamese would not know and that you could use to identify them. Like somebody had a dog named Spot or whatever, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. type of thing. Uh, and that, yeah, that was a chore to memorize all that, but Doug Hedgel memorized it too. And we'd practice it every day, just go through all the names and uh, by rank alphabetical by service, and uh, uh, Doug Hedgo was ordered by the senior officer to leave. When they Vietnamese wanted to send somebody back and they talked to Doug about it, the senior officer said, go, take all those names. Mm -hmm. So he did, good guy. My wife had ended up talking to him and to another guy released with that group who had been a cellmate at one time. Um, a guy named Mark Gartley. I think he was from Maine. Uh, there's a Mark Gartley. I felt so sorry for him. Uh, one day he was brought into interrogation and his mother was there. His mother came to bring him home. And what would you do? You know you're not supposed to, but I'd left to. I couldn't have He left done with that. her? He left with her. Um, and, you know, a lot of guys look down on him for that, but I don't. I, I mean, that's almost an impossible situation. Exactly. Um, at any rate, When we finally got ready to leave, they, they had issued us all uh, civilian clothes and shoes and a bag with a few things in it. You, and, and you brought that today? I you brought have, that. Um, um, stuff in that bag? Oh, Did yeah. You get that out and show yeah. that to me? Sure. Tell me what you have. Well, I'm not sure. It's been a long time <laughs> since I've been in here. <laughs> Well, first of all, pajamas, these are the bottoms. And at one time I fit in that, if you can believe it. And you wore that. Wore as that. As a prisoner. Yep. Uh, it's got a few stitch marks. They wouldn't give us a needle and thread, but we managed mm -hmm. to make some out of a piece of wire. Mm -hmm. uh, at any rate, that's the bottom part. And we had shorts that kind of matched the same stuff and that was fairly new I got that not too long before we left this jacket or shirt or whatever you want to call it very wrinkled but mm -hmm. it was the first one I was given I had that thing the whole six years uh, and supposedly that identified me to them mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know what, it, we never have figured out what it means, how they were doing that. But that's what we wore, winter, summer. And what were the temperatures there when you were there? What was the weather uh, like? Vietnam's kind of like Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be yeah. very hot, it never really freezes, mm -hmm. but because of the living conditions, if it gets down to 40 degrees, 
Right. I it's mean, cold. it's cold. <laughs> yeah. Um, what else do I have in here? Some things that. Here's a going away towel they issued. Kind of colorful, isn't it? A going away towel. Yeah. The ones that they issued during the time were just pure white with some threads on the colored threads on the ends, but this was it's not very clean, but if they washed it it'd probably fall apart. Whoops. Well, let's see. They gave us a bag. This bag here. And these are what they gave me back. Uh, there's an example of the postcard type of letter that we that's something that you mailed home, um, or something you it's, uh, received. No, I. That's something I got. Um, that was from my dad. There are several from my dad. This one's from my wife. One of the cards that I was sent, a Thanksgiving card. Little Christmas card from my sister. Oh. That's something from later. There are a couple things in here that came after the war. This is one in our newspaper article. Can I read this letter from your wife? Oh, sure, whatever. March 23rd, 1971. Dearest Gary, how thrilled we are to receive your February letter. It is wonderful to receive your letter so soon after you wrote it. And busy with speech contest at school, took Zach to a slumber party we had for my pom-pom squad at school. Becky is getting so big and is very sharp. She'll be a handful for her teacher. Yep. A home is Colorado. Is that... A home? Uh, they for lived us in is Illinois. What I'm dreaming of for two, Dar. Oh, our faith will see you through. We love you more every day. Kisses and hugs from the heart. There's a letter from my dad. I haven't looked at this stuff in a long time. There's a picture of you here. Is this you? That one's me after I got back. I think that's when we lived in Colorado Springs. I was stationed at the Air Force Academy. 
Um, this would have been before you were a prisoner, right? No, this is after. And then when were you released? What date were you released? Uh, March the 4th. Or no, March the 3rd, 73. There's uh, the code of conduct I mentioned on a little card. They also gave us a copy of the agreements, Paris agreements as pertains to POWs which they were obligated to do they under the terms. Yeah. The Vietnamese did. Uh -huh. What is this right here? Tobacco. Tobacco. <laughs> Not much sent, left sent of it. Sent to you there and... Yeah. and just more of that type of thing. I guess I've got one card I don't have in here, but I was, my artist roommate gave art lessons too. So mm -hmm. one of them was uh, a portrait of my daughter taken from a picture they sent, but I guess it's somewhere else. So nice there, historical things, what yeah. else do I have? A bar of go home soap <laughs> that actually is much nicer than the real soap we had. So they gave you one that was nicer than what you had. Yeah. And toothpaste. Tube of toothpaste. They did give us toothbrushes and toothpaste during uh, World War II when the Japanese occupied. Vietnam, millions starved to death. And they're very sensitive about somebody being hungry. So they really didn't try to starve us. They didn't try, you say? Right. And how much, you said, were you down to 150 total? Yeah. Or that's what you got too? Yeah. Those spent me at one time. Those are short. Can you believe that? Well. Those were go-home shorts. These were issued as part of the clothing. Uh, so that we, uh, when we got to the Philippines, we collected all the clothes they had given us to go home in, and it was distributed to poor people. So we didn't keep any of those outfits. Here's a old handkerchief that was in one of the packages I got. Oh. Stained and ugly. <laughs> and this is one of my prized possessions. This is the first cup I got they gave to me and it had a lid. Those were so rare to have a lid, mm -hmm. but it was so nice because you could put food in it or water and put the lid on and flies wouldn't get in uh -huh. it. But I had that thing the whole time. So like rice, they, was that, would that be full for a meal? Um, oh, no, they, uh, they bring food separately. You kept your water cup in oh, your room I see. Okay. This and they had a water. little pitcher of water they boiled up and gave to you. Yeah, that's superfluous. We had sandals made out of tires and the straps on them would uh, were made out of inner tubes. So you had the straps that kind of went over just kind of like what people wear around here, you know, except mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they were made out of tires. They'd last forever. <laughs> uh, I donated mine to a museum. Um, and <laughs> it was kind of funny because the, some of the guards were short 
and they would always have snow tire treads on their shoes. I don't know, so they'd be taller, so I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I guess they had a choice. Mm -hmm. At any rate, that's what I brought. Right. Um, so you said you received this documentation where they were going to release you. Right. And you were in the second group? Second large went. group. And then, so where did you go from there? You, uh, you said it was we delayed like a week. We first went to the Philippines. Mm -hmm. To a hospital there. Mm -hmm. uh, we stayed there for a couple days while we got emergency treatment and first real meal. Um, I, I got to tell you about getting on the airplane. We we were all taken in in buses to the uh, Hanoi airport and. There were all these great big C-141, shiny big airplanes there that they came to pick us up in, the Americans did. And we were turned over to an American general. And then we each had a person escorting, each one of us. Uh, and the person would take you by the arm and walk you into the airplane. And on the airplane I was in, there was this pretty little flight nurse that gave everybody a kiss. Uh, she smelled so good. Mm -hmm. uh, her name was Dawn. I'll never forget Dawn. And then we were taken to the Philippines. Uh, they did things like make his uniforms overnight. So they measured you one day and the mm -hmm. uniforms were there the next. Mm -hmm. People that needed glasses, they made those. People got emergency dental work. Uh, we all got treated for worms. And that's a whole story, but. Um, and then uh, we did go to a couple of the American military grade schools and meet with the kids. Uh, Before you got to see your family? Yes. Our families were in the U.S. Oh, okay. I so see. this okay. was just okay. kind of a stopover. But the kids had made posters. The walls of that hospital and the part we were were just covered with posters. Mm -hmm. uh, welcome home, mm -hmm. one way or another. Mm -hmm. um, so we kind of thought it was an obligation to go meet them. Mm -hmm. I did have a package of Vietnamese cigarettes, but I traded that to a crew chief for on the airplane for a cigar. At <laughs> uh, any rate, and then when we left the Philippines, we were put on these giant 141s again and taken to uh, Hawaii where we refueled. And then when we left for the continental US, they did a little flyby around the Golden Gate Bridge Mm -hmm. And then I came to uh, Scott Air Force Base down south in what is the town uh, outside of St. Louis. Mm -hmm. uh, and there I was in the hospital for about 10 days. Uh, we were being debriefed very intensively mostly after if there was anybody left up there or not. Uh, I did meet my family. I did request to meet them in private, much to my wife's chagrin. She wanted to run across the apron and jump in your arms thing, and I figured I'd just fall apart if I if that happened. And How was the reunion? It was very pleasant, very nice. Uh, my daughter, Becky, uh, she was a kid that never met a stranger, so it was, I was, she accepted me instantly. And uh, then they, in, a, in that hospital we were in at Scott, they had rooms like in a hotel for us. Mm -hmm. Uh, because we had to stay in the hospital a few nights, and a few nights we got out, but they partly was debriefing, and um, 
medical treatment and so mm -hmm. forth. And Becky was how old? She was like six, six. or seven, six? And how yeah. old was Zach? Zach was not born yet. Oh, what was not born? He's okay. after the war. Okay. Um, they're 10 years apart in age. Mm -hmm. The, oh, I guess, let's see, we stayed there and mostly the debriefing stuff. Um, then we came to my wife's hometown, which is Table Grove, Illinois, mm -hmm. and the town threw a big party for us, which was very nice. And at that point, the Air Force gave us a month off for every year you were a prisoner. So I had six months off. And then they gave you almost anything you asked for. The Air Force did. Um, I knew had I stayed in what my career path would have been the whole time. I was going back to college to get a master's in psychology. I had a teaching slot available at the Air Force Academy where then they would have sent me for a doctor's degree and I could have ended up head of a department probably because they were very nice to us. Mm -hmm. uh, but I decided on somewhere along the line that I owed more to my family than I did to service so I got out after a couple of years. That's about it for that part. Were you treated um, by the public? I, I, you know, I've, I know some were not treated kindly when they came back. Did you experience it's, any of that? It's, that has always been a sadness to me mm -hmm. because we were treated like royalty. We literally walked on red carpets when we got off the airplanes. Uh, I met generals and admirals and ambassadors and all that, um, and the GIs from the South, you know, that just came back, mm -hmm. they were treated horribly, mm -hmm. awful, uh, spit on and everything else. Right. One of my really good friends was a platoon leader, army platoon leader in South Vietnam. He's got three Purple Hearts one of the bravest men I know personally. Um, but he always used to say, if we were really baby killers like we're called, they'd only say that once. Um, you know, you take somebody who's been out in the jungle killing people and you're going to insult him. Uh, it took a world of patience to deal with that for those guys. And I always felt like, heck, I'm no more a hero than they are. Or were, they're more of a hero than I am. I mean, I don't feel like anything special. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that happened to be in a little too low altitude one night. <laughs> and then I survived. But that's the way it was. So I stayed in. I was a flight instructor at the Air Force Academy for a little while before I got out. And we came back and I started farming with my father-in-law. Um, Did, I don't think I've asked you about your medals. Did I ask you about the medals that you oh, received? Okay. I know we wrote um, them down, but could you state for the record? Sure, I have a Distinguished Flying Cross, uh, a Bronze Star, a um, Legion of Merit, um, nine Air Medals, one for each of 90, you know, each of 10 missions for 90. Uh, I have a Purple Heart for my injuries. Uh, before ejecting and in the process and a second purple heart for injuries while being tortured and uh, let's see I have a POW medal that's fairly new that they, they just came out with those a few years back National Defense Ribbon um, 
Vietnamese campaign ribbon and a Vietnamese government award uh, which I'm not sure I guess Vietnam service ribbon I'm not mm -hmm. sure what they that call it. That was given to you by that government you said? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is there any um, thing that like caught causes flashbacks, triggers flashbacks or anything for you? Anything that's yes. Not as frequent as it used to be. After I was back, it was uh, 2002, I was driving to work. Uh, I We lived in Missouri at the time and I worked downtown St. Louis for an insurance company and at 70 miles an hour a wreck developed all around me and fortunately I wasn't involved but I remember looking over my shoulder and there was a car hitting the concrete median wall mm -hmm. on its side mm -hmm. and for all the world it was a wingman crashing for all the world it was uh, I knew it wasn't, but it was. Mm -hmm. And that just destroyed me. All the guilt came back. And Later on, I was diagnosed with PTSD. Mm -hmm. uh, they said that, <laughs> they said you're probably always a little crazy from the time you got back, he said, but sometimes these things just pop to the surface like holding a balloon underwater that uh, it just happens all of a sudden and that's what happened to me and I was a real mess for several years but got through all that. Because of that one wreck or? Uh -huh. Because of the results of what it did to me emotionally. Uh, How long had you been back? At what point was that? Do you remember? Well, it's a long time because this was just what 2002, I oh, think. Oh, okay, yeah, you said that. I'm sorry. So, gosh. Yeah, uh, and uh, there were a lot of significant things happened at that point, but. Um, so 30 years later, and. 30 years like later. In retrospect, I can remember other symptoms that I didn't realize from earlier. The main thing was guilt. I was never dangerous to anybody but myself. Um, but we got through it. Uh, my wife is one of these people who can fix things. She's going to fix anything, and you can't mm -hmm. fix that. Mm -hmm. unfortunately so it was very hard on us mm -hmm. uh, but I took pills and had counseling and a long conversation with my son one night which kind of it didn't end it but it certainly made a big corner right there big turn uh, I sympathize with people that have it. I've known a lot of them. Mm -hmm. It's sad. I kind of view it as personally as a weakness, but it is what it is. So what are you going to do? Not I mean, weakness. weakness or whatever you call it. Mm -hmm. So you do what you always do. You survive. Mm -hmm. And I have a lot of other physical problems from the war. Uh, you know, the broken back, I've had heart problems, blood pressure, bad knees, bad hip, you name it, mm -hmm. frostbite. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, I feel fairly healthy, but I don't think I am, really. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'd have been dead three or four times for the things I've had wrong with me, except for medical science. Uh, but I feel good now. I'm happy. Uh, we're living a very good life and enjoying it a lot. And uh, 
sometime you would want to include my wife in an interview because she can tell stories <laughs> you like know that. of the minister and the chaplain coming to talk to her of visits from the FBI how was she notified um, uh, a uh, Air Force chaplain came okay. with a local minister mm -hmm. and she went to Paris to meet with Avril Harriman, who was a negotiator for us at that time. Um, and she did a lot. She was one of the founders of the League of Families that still exists. Um, she was very active. So was my dad. Mm -hmm. uh, but she could she can have you in tears with her stories of what happened. Okay. One time we gave a speech to an insurance agency and we took turns at two podiums uh, telling our story chronologically. Mm -hmm. I'd talked and she'd mm -hmm. talked and you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and there wasn't a dry eye in the place, including ours. Mm -hmm. um, so she has her own story as do all the families. It, not is just, her viewpoint like being at home with your daughter and yeah, like that? Yeah, and things she did and had to do and mm -hmm. um, it's just kind of a, well it's a different perspective, whole different per right. perspective. In some ways it was much easier on me because I knew they're okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Basically. Yeah, known for her. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I never worried about where a meal came from or paid a bill, so, but I knew they were okay, so in that respect it was easier. She had no idea about me right. for a long time. And we're still together. Yeah. I chose well, yes. or she did. You both did. <laughs> <laughs> you both did. Yeah, so, at any rate. Any other questions? Well, I don't think I have any other, but if you have anything else you would like to add. Uh, can I say something political? You can say anything you like. Okay. Me and a lot of guys like me spend an important part of our lives fighting socialist governments. Mm -hmm. And now we're becoming one. Mm -hmm. And it breaks my heart. Um, I'm glad that I won't live long enough to, to see it all. That's my political statement. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and thank you for coming in today. Oh, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed um, it. I talked your ear off. but No, you, it, it's been my honor. Uh, Thank you for your service. And thank you. Like I said, thank you for sharing your story. And I will stop the recording here. Okay.